Okay, here we are on a, a nice beautiful evening out here in God's creation. And uh, I'm going to do our Sunday morning sermon here for June 2nd, 2013. Apologize about the sun. As it goes down, it's going to dip below the hill there and then lighting will be better. I always have a habit of finding you know, times when the lighting isn't that great many times but uh, when you're out here in nature you don't really have a choice you don't have studio lighting and everything else like a lot of my other videos but I want to talk to you today about the Bible doctrine of easy believism a lot of people say what I thought you didn't believe in that oh no the King James Bible actually does teach easy believism but there's a catch to it now see there's this movement out there right now among some of the brethren at least professing brethren and they try to say salvation, there's no repentance involved with salvation. They try to make it just that you believe and you receive. And I'm going to show you today that that is quite heretical. And in fact, I'm going to turn to a lot of the verses, a lot of the scriptures that they will use to defend their doctrine. And one of the greatest ones that they use is Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 31. So you can turn there in your Bible, Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 31. Okay, we're going to go over the whole story, So, um, but the basic context is here that Paul and Silas are in prison, and you know there's an earthquake, and the jailer's going to hurt himself, and they say, don't do that, you know, and, and then they go, and the guy comes in and falls down before him, before him and says, verse 30, and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Okay, here's a man saying, what do I have to do to be saved? And look at the reply, verse 31, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Now, was the word repentance in there? No. Did Paul say, repent and believe? No. So see, the easy believism person will come to this passage, and they will say, see, the word repentance is not in there. The word repent is not in there. So therefore, there is no repentance connected with salvation. But let me show you the problem with that. Let's get the context of this chapter. Turn back to verse 16. We're going to read down through verse 18. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out the same hour. Now, what did Paul do there? He cast out a devil. A spirit of divination is not the Holy Spirit. Okay? It's divination in the Bible is forbidden. All right? It's not prophecy. Prophecy, prophesying is, is telling what's going to happen in the future by the power of the Holy Spirit. Divination is another spirit that comes in and tries to predict the future. And sometimes they'll get it, sometimes they don't. You know, see any kind of fortune teller if you want proof of that. But the fact of the matter is, divination, the spirit of divination, it was a devil, a spirit of a devil. Paul casts it out. Now, as Bible-believing Christians, you understand that that's a good thing that Paul did. But what if you're not a Bible-believing Christian? I have here an article, the Anglican Inc., it's called. And this is May 20th of 2013, so just a little over a week ago. Uh, this woman here, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, says here, The presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church has denounced the Apostle Paul as mean-spirited and bigoted for having released a slave girl from demonic bondage, as reported in Acts 16, verses 16 through 34. Huh? He is mean-spirited and bigoted because he cast a devil out of a woman? Huh. Isn't that interesting? Now listen to what some of the stuff that this devil-possessed lunatic woman says, and I'm of course, I'm putting this all up on screen so you can read it for yourself. She says, quote, Just as the forces of historic inevitability led to the ending of industrial slavery, so too would the march of progress lead to a change in attitude towards homosexuality, she argued. Oh boy. So what's her motive? She's a sodomite. That's why she's saying that Paul was mean-spirited and bigoted. 
Hmm. Had a little agenda there. Continuing here, she says, quote, But Paul is annoyed, perhaps for being put in his place. And he responds by depriving her of her gift of spiritual awareness. Paul can't abide something he won't see as beautiful or holy, so he tries to destroy it. I guess Jesus did the same thing by casting devils out. You know, this woman's a lunatic. It gets him thrown in prison. That's pretty much where he's put himself by his own refusal to recognize that she too shares in God's nature. Just as much as he does, maybe more so. End quote. So a woman that's possessed with a devil actually is sharing in God's nature. According to this satanic lunatic. Continuing. However... After Paul is released from prison, she says here, However, Paul now repents of his mistake in casting out the spirit of divination, she argues. So when he gets out, he repents of that. She says here, It makes me wonder what would have happened to that slave girl if Paul had seen the spirit of God in her. As you can see there, it's a capital G. Hmm. The spirit of God in her. Yeah. Yeah. She concluded her sermon by stating that we are not justified by our faith, but by our respect for diversity. Oh boy. The presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. Huh. Then she goes on to say, quote, Salvation comes not from being cleansed of our sins by the atoning sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, but through the divinization of humanity through the work of the human will. What did Satan say back there in the Garden of Eden? Ye can be as gods, knowing good and evil. That's exactly what this demented woman just said. The divinization of the human mind. Ye can be as gods. She goes on to say, God among us in human form is the most glorious act we know. God among us in human form. Ye can be as gods. Things really haven't changed in 6,000 years. Satan still uses the same lies to deceive people. But I thought this was interesting. When I got on that, uh, when I got onto this thing here, okay, there's no more quotes on that. Um, you can comment on this, on this uh, thing that she said here in this article and look at the number of comments on there. Six hundred sixty-six. Interesting number, isn't it? What a strange coincidence, right? But let's continue here. Okay, I just want to throw that thing in there, just a little bit of a uh, prophecy update, if you will. But let's look and see here. Paul cast the devil out of this woman. Now let's continue on. Verse 19. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful. Oh boy. The combination of secular and religious powers. Yeah. Tall customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. Hmm. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Okay, so you see there, Paul and Silas are taken, they're beaten, and then thrown into prison. And what does the prison keeper guy, what does he do? I mean, are these guys really a threat to anybody? They're out there preaching the word, and the prison keeper takes them in and puts their feet in stocks. Why? <laughs> They've just been beaten. What's the big deal? Well, the fact of the matter is there are many people that are more threatened by you if you're a Bible-believing Christian than if you're a thief or a murderer or whatever. The lost world is threatened by people who believe and preach this book. 
another reality that has not changed. But let's continue here. Verse 25. Now, what would be the reaction of the most modern professing Christians to being beaten and imprisoned wrongfully? They'd be trying to get on the phone with their lawyer or something, right? What's Paul and Silas' reaction? Verse 25. And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Sang praises unto God? Well, yeah, you'll get that after a while when you're saved. When you start to realize the fact that when you are beaten, when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake, you should glorify God on that behalf. And you can actually sing praise when people mock you and put you down and attack you and spitefully use you and persecute you. You can actually praise the Lord in a time like that. Now, what do you think the jailer thought about that when he was hearing that? That guy that just came in there and fastened their feet into the stocks. Saw they were beaten and everything. And he's thinking about all these other prisoners and he's going, none of those other prisoners sang. These guys are singing praises to the Lord. What an amazing thing. Verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. Why was he going to kill himself? Because he knew, number one, he was sleeping on the job, which you don't do if you're a prison guard, you know, prison keeper. Number two, he thought all the prisoners had escaped. So if he didn't kill himself, his bosses would have. So he gets scared and he says, oh man, i got to kill myself here. But look what happens. Verse 28. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. Hmm. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, consider a few points here. First of all, the prison keeper had no problem locking up Paul and Silas, two men who were innocent. Okay, so was he in a state of repentance at that point? No, he wasn't in a state of repentance when he locked them up at first. He didn't have any guilt. Hell, let's let, lock these guys up, I'll put their feet in the stocks. What do I care? Then, after that, he's falling asleep and he hears them in there singing praises to God. Did he have any conviction at that point? Did he have any repentance at that point? Well, not really. Maybe he had a little bit of conviction. Maybe he felt a little bit of guilt about locking up two men that were innocent. But still, you couldn't really say he was in a repentant state. But all of a sudden, there's an earthquake. And all the prison doors open up. And this guy realizes God has just done this amazing thing here. And... He's going to kill himself. Paul and Silas could have said, Hey, shh, just let the guy do it. We'll get out of here. You know, we'll just be able to sneak out easier that way. And what's Paul do? He cries out to a man who's basically his enemy and he says, Don't do yourself any harm. Do thyself no harm. We're all here. Paul reached out to the guy. And what was the guy's reaction to that? He came in, it says there, um, verse 29, he, call, he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before them. Now, you know what that is? That's called repentance. That's called going from being a proud prison keeper to now having fear, the fear of the Lord. Okay? He knew who made that earthquake. He heard them singing praises to God. Then he hears that there's this earthquake and everything else, and now he comes in and he falls down before God. Or, I'm sorry, not before God, but he's falling down at the feet of these two men. And he says, what must I do to be saved? So for Paul to say at that point in time, well, buddy, you need to repent. Do you know for sure if you're a sinner or not? You know, Have you ever committed sin? Let's go through the commandments and let's see if you're a sinner. Paul didn't need to do that. Why? Because the guy came to him in a broken condition. Now if you're out and you're witnessing to somebody and they come in there in a broken condition, 
you don't need to tell them to repent. Repentance is there for those who are self-righteous and proud. They're the ones that need to be broken. They're the ones that need to have their pride brought down low so that they can get saved. Okay, That's why easy believism is so deadly. Because you have people coming with their own self-righteousness and they're coming in their pride and they're praying some prayer thinking that that means that they're saved now. And they never were broken. That's the problem with easy believism. Okay? By excluding repentance and saying the Bible, in certain cases, there's no repentance taught here. Yes, there is. It's in context. But let's continue. What about the dying thief? There's another one that I've heard people refer to, that there's no repentance in that whole thing. Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. We'll start out here in verse 42. Okay, Luke 23, 42 says, And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Okay, now we're not going to get into the dispensational thing here. You know, I'm just using these verses as instruction in righteousness, as, you know, there's some doctrine here. But the point is, did Jesus tell the guy to repent? No. Did Jesus say to the guy, well, you know, okay, I'm, you want me to remember you, you know, when, when I come into my kingdom, but have you repented? No, Jesus, Jesus didn't say that. And so the easy believism type person will say, well, see, no repentance again. But look up at verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. He was only worried about his own hide. Verse 40, but the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear, or dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. Not only did this dying thief understand that he was a sinner, he understood he was worthy of the death that he was dying, and he understood that Jesus Christ was completely innocent. Again, He's in a repentant state. He did not need repentance preached to him. That's very important to remember. But let's continue on here. I'll just... What about the uh, 3,000 that got saved in Acts chapter 2? Go to Acts chapter 2. We'll look about this next. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. That's where we'll go. Okay, it says here, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Okay, they gladly received the word. Did it say that they had to repent? Well, not in that verse. No, they just believed. They believed and received. Oh, and at this point in time, they were being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ there, for the remission of sins. Okay? So then you say, well, there's no bapt or there's no repentance there. Well, look up at verse 36. Peter here preaching to him, he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. So there you see, repent. Repentance comes before belief. It's just the way it is. These people didn't say, yeah, okay, you know, what do we got to do? Huh. They were pricked in their heart. When Peter said, ye crucified him. You were the ones that killed Jesus Christ. It's your fault. You were the ones that were there saying, crucify him, crucify him. You, 
you, pointing at their, right in their faces, saying, you. And they were convicted. They were convicted and, and brought low before God. That led to their salvation. They were not there in their pride, like most people are. And I'm going to show you some examples of people that come in pride. How about the woman at the well that Jesus met? John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 21. Okay, John 4.21 says, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Okay, there's a lot of people that say, oh, Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. I know John Hagee said that the one time. Right there he did. Okay, so don't fall for that either. But the fact is, did he tell her to repent? No. Jesus didn't say anything to her about repenting. But why don't we look up at uh, verse 16. John 4, verse 16. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that saidst thou truly. Jesus knew that this woman was a pretty wicked sinner. She had been with five different men as her husbands. And he said, why don't you go get your husband? Test him to see if she would admit to her sins or if she was too proud to admit to her sins. And she lowered her pride and she admitted to her sins. And as a result, now she's ready to be told about salvation. Now she's ready for belief. She comes first as a sinner, then she can have belief. You see how this thing works? You see how this is so elementary? You should just be able to get this thing, no problem. But some of these people, they want to have the big numbers of people that they've led to the Lord, you know, and all this other stuff. It's very sad. How about the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8? Go there next. Acts chapter 8. Now, if you're using an NIV, you're going to have a hard time with this passage because a very important verse is removed from your Catholic Bible. Acts chapter 8, verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Did you see anything about repentance? No. Not in those verses. But look up at verse 27 in Acts chapter 8. It says here, And he arose and went, and behold, a, great, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. This was a religious man. He knew about the things of the Bible and, and things like that. Okay? Didn't know who Jesus Christ was yet, but he knew about the things of the Lord. And he'd actually come there to worship. Now, according, according to some of the brethren, they would say, well, then he didn't, you know, he shouldn't have needed to be saved because after all, he has belief, you know, what's the big deal? All right? And, of course, I know some of you are going, well, he didn't believe in Jesus or anything like that. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to get to that. Verse 28 through 34. Okay, it says, Was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah at the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? 
And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Okay. The eunuch there is reading in Isaiah, and he's saying, this, whoever's being written about here, it's obvious that they're, they're dying for somebody's sins. And who's this? Is, he, is this Isaiah that did this, or is this some other man? What's going on here? I don't understand this. Now, why didn't he just go, oh, that's a pretty story? Well, probably because he knew in his heart, this is a, whoever is going through this thing here, in the book of Isaiah, whoever is suffering for sins, they're probably suffering for a sinner like me. Okay? And look what Philip says to him. Verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So Philip says, I know who this guy is. In fact, I know him personally. I can introduce you to him. And so Philip preaches Jesus Christ to this Ethiopian eunuch. And the Ethiopian eunuch says, Ah, okay. There's that Savior that I've been looking for. And he gets saved. And Philip takes him down into the water and baptizes him. Again, you cannot say that there was no repentance on the part of the eunuch. That it was just simply belief. Yes, there was repentance. He was reading about a man dying for his sins. And when Philip expounded the scriptures to him and said, This man that died for your sins is Jesus Christ. Then that Ethiopian eunuch said, okay, now I know how to get saved. Now I know what I need to do to get saved. All right, and he gets saved, and then he goes and he gets baptized. So again, you can't get easy believism out of that passage there. But it says there that Philip preached unto him Jesus. So what did Jesus preach? Matthew chapter 21 Matthew chapter 21, verse 23. Okay. Now think about what Jesus was doing here when he was on the earth. Okay. He was doing all kinds of miracles, raising people from the dead, you know, and, you know, restoring sight to the blind, you know, healing the, the lame, causing the maimed to be whole, you know, casting out devils. He was doing some amazing things. But look at here, it says, verse 23, And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things, and who gave thee this authority? You know, they'll still do that today. I get that a lot. By what authority do you do these things? Are you ordained and licensed? Where's your church building? Uh, sorry, <laughs> that stuff's not scriptural. All right? But continuing. I mean, if they did it to Jesus Christ, they're going to do it to you too. Verse 24, And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. Now let me ask you a question. Why didn't the chief priests and the elders believe Jesus? Hadn't they seen enough? Hadn't they seen enough miracles that they could have easily believed on Jesus Christ to be saved? Oh sure. There shouldn't have been any question as to who Jesus Christ was. So what was it that kept them from believing? Look at verse 28. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said likewise, and he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father? 
they say unto him the first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Oh boy. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. Hmm. So in other words, the publicans and harlots, being sinners, and knowing that they were sinners, when the gospel was preached to them, that they were to repent, there was no question in their minds. There was no self-righteous pride that, that sprung up and said, who do you think you're talking to? Well, how dare you speak to me that way? No. You go to a public or a harlot and you say, are you a sinner? Do you deserve to go to hell? Nine times out of ten, they'll say, yeah. I do. I am a sinner. I deserve to go to hell. I'm not a good person. They know. I mean, if they're honest, maybe they're so deceived or whatever that they would try to fight you know, on the thing or whatever. But if one's really honest, they'll say, yeah, I'm a sinner. But you go to somebody who's self-righteous, like a chief priest or an elder of a synagogue, you know, the, the, the rulers of the land, and you say to them, are you a sinner? <laughs> Me? I'm not like a publican or a harlot. See? But notice there in verse 32, he says here, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. So John comes, John the Baptist comes, and he's preaching to them that they need to repent. And they don't believe. And then he does signs and wonders, and that should have been enough to make the Pharisees and the scribes and the chief priests and the elders, that should have been enough to make them repent and to say, wait a second here, this isn't just some guy out here yelling and telling us we need to repent. They should have turned at that point from their own self-righteousness. And some of them did. You'll read about that. Some of the Pharisees did get saved. But a lot of these people, in their pride, they said, no, no. I'm not a sinner. I'm not a bad person. See? And a lot of them, and we're going to see this a little bit later, their decisions were made because they feared the people. You see, they had knowledge of forethought of what real salvation would mean. They knew that salvation meant a changed life. And that's why they don't want it. That's why people today don't want to be saved. Really, truly born again. Because they fear the people. That's the truth. But let's continue here. Mark chapter 1. Turn over to Mark chapter 1 in your Bible. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Wait a second, that must be a, re or a misprint there. It's, it's repent before believe? Yeah, that's what it says. No, it's not a misprint. That's the way it is. Repentance comes before belief. If you don't turn from your own self-righteousness, if you don't turn from your own pride of thinking you're a good person, there's no sense believing because you're believing in vain. Paul wrote about that. Unless you have believed in vain. Is it possible for somebody to believe in Jesus Christ in vain? Well, you better believe it. Well, absolutely. I'm going to show you that in a little bit. But now look at... Uh, Mark chapter 2, verse 14. Mark chapter 2, verse 14. It says here, And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of, of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance." Uh, shouldn't it say sinners to belief? No. Sinners to repentance. 
You need to turn from your pride. You need to turn from your own self-righteousness. And you need to understand that your sin is what is causing you to be headed for hell. And don't tell me the lost world doesn't know that. That's why they're always trying to justify their sin. Trying to say it's no big deal. My conscience doesn't convict me. I was born this way. I have an alternative lifestyle. All this other stuff. They know that they're sinners. And see, they know that real true conversion means that sinful life has to go. I didn't say that they have to clean up their life before they get saved. That's Lordship Salvation. I didn't say that. And I'm getting real sick and tired of these little nothings on YouTube that are coming out and saying that I'm teaching work salvation and, and some kind of Lordship Salvation all this other stuff. I do not. And you are ignorant of what those things truly mean. You don't know what Lordship Salvation truly is. Lordship Salvation is teaching that you get rid of your sins and then later God grants you salvation. God grants you repentance to salvation. That's what Lordship Salvation is. Teaching that a sinner has to understand that they're a sin and has to be willing to forsake sin, that's not Lordship Salvation. Okay, if I said that you had to do that before you get saved, then yeah, it would be. But I'm saying after you come to God as a sinner in a repentant state where you say, I'm giving up my pride, my self-righteousness, I can't do anything to save myself, I'm a sinner. That's not Lordship Salvation. But let's continue here. Okay? And let me just say this. Jesus said here, one more point before we continue, in verse 17, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. Okay? Let me just illustrate that. You see this? This is a stick. Very good, right? I need to fix this stick. You say, why? There's nothing wrong with the stick. It's whole. Well, then what must I do to this stick before I can fix it? It has to be broken. You know what this is? It's a picture of a sinner. I can't fix the stick until it's broken. Now I can work to put the thing back together again. Okay? But before it's broken, I can't do anything with it. Same thing with a sinner. God can't fix a sinner until they're broken until they know that they're broken, until they know that they need a solution. I mean, I heard the one time, you know, talk about the word gospel. What is gospel? What does that mean? The good news. Well, what, why do you need good news? If you don't know anything at all about your sin and you don't realize that you're going to hell or anything like that, what's the point of good news? The good news is, dear friend, that you are a sinner, that you are in trouble with a holy, righteous God up there. That he looks down at your life and he says, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. All the righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That's what the Lord looks down and he sees. That's how he sees you. He doesn't look down and say, oh, I'm so impressed with you and your house and your car and everything else. He's not impressed. God looks down at you as a sinner and you have no chance of ever being good enough to get into heaven, okay? But God sent his son to die on the cross. See, he was perfect. He did something that you can't do and that I can't do. And by faith in what he did on the cross, we can now go to heaven by what Jesus Christ did. But only if we come to God as a broken sinner. Let me show you. Matthew chapter 21 Matthew 21. Matthew 21, verse 42 is where we're going to go. It says here, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, 
but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Have you fallen on Jesus Christ? Have you come to the knowledge of understanding what Jesus Christ was and what he did here on the earth? Have you come to the understanding of realizing that he was perfect? And that he became sin, who knew no sin? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him? Have you come to that understanding? Have you come to the point where you've realized, I can't make it. I'm no good. Have you come to that point? You say, yeah, I actually have. I, I've really start, started to realize how rotten and wicked and things I am. Okay? Now it gets easy. You see, the hard part is repenting. That's the hard part. The hard part is realizing that your membership in some building someplace that they call a church, that isn't going to save you. The good deeds that you've done, that's not going to save you. Those nice things and the nice thing, times that you've, whatever, none of that stuff saves you. Your baptism doesn't save you. Your tithing, your giving to charity doesn't save you. None of that stuff. And until you get rid of your self-righteous pride, you're not going to make it. You're not getting in. Repentance is hard. Turning from that life of sin that you've grown accustomed to and realizing I'm going to have to clean up my life. I'm going to have to do, I don't understand what all it entails yet, but I know that if I become a Christian, things are going to change. I can't go to the nightclubs anymore. I can't go and fornicate anymore. I can't get drunk anymore. I can't smoke cigarettes anymore. And you say, yes, I know Christians that do. Well, I do too. And their lives are a mess. Their lives are a wreck. Okay? What I'm saying is if you want to get anything done for the Lord, if you want to be used of God, and you mess around with that flesh, if you live after the flesh, you will die, the Bible says. Okay? But my point is, as a lost person, you've got to realize your life is going to change. And it might not happen right away, but it will happen. As time goes by, you will give up more and more and more and more of that sin. That's called sanctification. That comes after salvation. If you teach that sanctification is coming before you get saved, then yeah, that's heresy. Okay? That's not what the Bible teaches. Sanctification comes after salvation. But the lost person, they know that. They can understand that. They know things are going to change if I get saved. That's why most of them don't get saved. That's a shame. And it's a real shame that there are false prophets out there that are trying to tell sinners now that, oh no, there's no change. You know, I'll kind of slip you in the back door of salvation and all of a sudden then I'll spring it on you. Then I'll tell you, oh no, these, these things are going to have to change. You can't watch pornographic movies anymore and you can't get drunk and you can't cheat on your wife and you can't whatever else. You know, we'll get them saved and then we'll spring teaching them about sin. Then we'll spring it on them and say, oh now you have to be ch changed and you know, uh-uh, it doesn't work that way. And you know what the funny thing is? Lost people have better sense than that. I've met a lot of lost people. They know that salvation means a changed life. I don't even have to say it to them. They know it. And they resist it. I know of rough, tough old men that don't want to get saved because they don't want to face their buddies down at the hardware store or down at the bar or down at the restaurant or wherever they hang out. They don't want to face them and have to go in there and say, I got saved. They don't want to do it. Why? They're chickens, scared, cowards. That's what's going on. Let's look next at Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30. You say what? So then you're saying, Brian, that there's something that happens after you get saved? You're saying that there's some kind of a change that has to occur? That you now have a set of rules put on you if you get saved? Oh, that's exactly what I'm saying. Let's look at the words of Jesus Christ here. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What are those people? They're struggling with sin. They are sinners. They're having a hard time in life. Verse 29, Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest 
unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Wait a second. A yoke and a burden? That's what you put on the neck of a slave. Do you ever see these pictures of these old slave trains, you know, when they're taking them off to the port to, to ship them over to America or wherever else? They got the yoke on them. They got a collar on them. Guess what? When you get saved, the Lord reaches down out of heaven and He says, Congratulations, I now purchased you. Did you know you're looking at a slave right now? I'm what the Bible calls a bond servant. I don't have the free will to do whatever I want. I can, but then I'm going to get whipped. Why? My life's not my own. I'm bought with a price. When God shed His blood on Calvary's cross, that payment that was there came, and anybody that wants to be saved, you now have to be purchased by God. And by the way, the final decision is up to Him. God looks on the heart, and He can see if somebody's just fooling around. I've had atheists mockingly, you know, act, go through the prayer of salvation or something, and say, oh, I believe in Jesus Christ, oh, you know, mocking. Now don't tell me, you know, well, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. No, don't give me that. God looks on the heart, and He can see if somebody's really sincere or not, if they're really truly repentant or not. But you see what happens is, when somebody comes and they're truly repentant and they get saved, and now they're willing to live for the Lord, God goes, okay, and He puts that collar around your neck. He puts that yoke of a bond servant, and He says, your life belongs to me. Yes, you're my child, you're my adopted son or daughter, but you're also my bondservant. And when I tell you, thou shalt not. And when I command you, don't do this, don't do that. I want you to do this, and I want you to do that. You don't have a right to say, nah, don't feel like doing that. You can, but then you'll never get anywhere in life. And by the way, if you really truly get saved and you really truly submit yourself to that yoke of bondage that comes from the Lord, you'll find exactly what it says there. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, one of the most blessed things is to live as a Christian. I mean, right now, it's getting to be dark out here. You know, it's getting to be nighttime. My wife and I could get in a vehicle and go to a bar and we could get drunk. First of all, it's going to cost us money to get there. Then it's going to cost us money for the alcohol. Then it's going to give us a bad time and Lord only knows what could happen after you're drunk. Wreck the vehicle on the way home. But let's just say we make it home and everything else and get there safely. The next day you're sick, you got a hangover. Cool, man. Oh, the Lord's such a meanie by telling me I can't do that. <laughs> okay. You know. Uh, how about watching dirty movies? Wrecks your brain. How about listening to the wrong kind of music? Also wrecks your brain and causes you to be aggressive and you do stupid things there too. You know? Why is it that they sell vehicles with heavy music? Why is it that a lot of places sell things by very hard drum beats? Because it appeals to the flesh. So you make a living at, you know, listening to that kind of music, you listen to it all the time, your flesh is going to be in control, which means problems. So you see, the yoke and that burden that the Lord puts on you, and He says, I'm going to control you now. I'm going to tell you what to do. He's going to steer you right. And you work and you serve the Lord, you know, even if there was no rewards for it. Even if there was nothing in eternity, it's still the best life. Being a Christian. A real, true, Bible-believing Christian. And doing the work of the Lord. There's still no better life than this. But even over and above that, when we get to be in eternity, He's going to crown those who have worked faithfully for Him. Now, what are you going to get on earth like that? You know, if you work hard enough and you work for years and years and years and keep yourself in perfect condition, you can go to the Olympics, and if you win, then you'll get this stupid little medal. It's not even pure gold or pure silver or pure copper. <laughs> it's, you know, metal. Some dumb little metal there that's around your neck. Woo, whoop de doo How about a crown of gold put on your head by the God of the universe? How about that? You talking about a uh, award ceremony? The judgment seat of Christ is going to be something else. 
So uh, the, the burden and the yoke that the Lord puts upon you as a Christian is pretty good. It's a pretty good deal. But let's continue here. You say, well then, uh, so you're saying, Brian, that belief is not enough for a sinner. You can't just simply come to God and, and have belief in Jesus Christ. That's not true salvation. Is that what you're saying, Brian? Well, let's check about that. James chapter 2. James chapter 2. You know, people have this notion that they think to themselves that, you know, if they've prayed some prayer at some point in time in their lives and they believe, I believe in Jesus, I believe that Jesus existed, I believe He died on the cross for my sins, you know, well then they must be saved. Not so. Check this one out. James chapter 2 verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. The devils believe in one God. That doesn't say that they believe that Jesus died on the cross for their sins or something. I know it doesn't say that. But the fact is, they believe in one God. And there's a lot of people out there, they hear some athlete or something like that, some steroid head on, on television, and the guy goes, I just want to thank the big man upstairs. And people at home go, oh, praise the Lord, he's a Christian. <laughs> no, that's the confession of a devil. A man that has a devil in him says, I believe there's one God. And you get some stupid celebrity on TV and he goes, I believe in the one God. People go, wow, he's a Christian. <laughs> no, that's a confession of a devil. A little discernment here, people. Belief is not enough. There must be a repentant state before belief. And I've done other messages on this thing. It's all through the Bible. Okay, you have to be a new creature. Something has to change, right? There's a lot to salvation. It's easy. It's not that difficult. I do believe in easy believism. You come to God as a sinner, it's easy to believe what Jesus Christ did for you. It's easy, easiest thing in the world. But if you're not coming as a sinner, not coming willing to live for the Lord after your salvation, not willing to be a bondservant of Jesus Christ, if you're not willing to do that, then no. You're not going to be saved. It's just as simple as that. I'm going to show you a couple things here real quick. Got to hurry up. It's starting to get dark and we're getting eaten, eaten alive here by mosquitoes. Let me ask you a question. You say, so then it takes more than belief. You're saying that somebody who just says that they believe, they confess Jesus Christ, that uh, they're not truly saved. That, that's exactly what I'm saying. Let me just give you a, just something to think about here. Let me ask you a question. Are sodomite professing Christians, are they saved? You say, do they believe in Jesus Christ? Oh, sure. You can go to gaychurch.org. They have over 7,000, I think it's 7,100, over 7,100 churches that accept them, that are okay with the lesbian, bisexual, uh, transgender, LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Yeah, you know, LGBT friendly churches. Over 7,100 of them. And you can look them up for your state. So I picked a couple here out of Pennsylvania. Here we have the in the About Us page, you know, it's just belief. Remember, there's no repentance involved. There's no turning from sin. There's no, there's no, I got to change my life after I get saved. It's just belief, right? Listen to this. Quote, God comes to us in grace and love in the person of Jesus Christ, who lived, died, and rose for us so that we might have eternal and abundant life in him. They believe in Jesus, don't they? But it's a LB. GT, LGBT, whatever, you know, sodomite, I'll say it that way, sodomite building. And that's Bryn Mawr Presbyterian Church, www.bmpc.org. Again, I'll show it to you there on the screen there. You've seen it. Okay, the next one. It says here in the picture, again, you can see this. It says, to know Christ and make Christ known. That's their 
motto. To know Christ and to make Christ known. Do they believe in Jesus? Well, sure they believe in Jesus. Of course they believe in Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? But uh, what's the name of the church? I'll read you another thing here you can see on the website. Quote, Temple Lutheran Church is a community of baptized persons who exist to hear and share the good news of God's love revealed in Jesus Christ. Again, another group of people that believe in Jesus Christ. But there's no repentance. These people are in their self-righteousness. They're not repenting. And that's Temple Lutheran Church, Havertown, PA, www.templelutheran.org. Next one, quote, We are a church of Jesus Christ in which all people are welcome. Every member is a minister. The world is our responsibility. Disciple-making is our goal, and worship is our duty and delight. Please join us in fulfilling this mission. It says there, we are a church of Jesus Christ. Do they believe in Jesus? Well, absolutely, of course they do. What is that? First United Methodist Church of Hershey, PA. First UMC Hershey.org. Okay, the next one. Quote, American Baptists believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and that the Bible is the divinely inspired Word of God that serves as the final written authority for living out the Christian faith. American Baptists celebrate the fact that belief in Jesus Christ assures salvation and eternal fellowship with a loving God. First Baptist Church of Philadelphia, PA. www.firstbaptistphiladelphia.org So there you have four different buildings, all of which profess to believe in Jesus Christ. All of them. Well now, according to some of the brethren, that's all it takes. There's no changed life. There's no change there. But they believe, don't they? You see the problem? Philippians 1.29 Two more places to turn to here. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. Okay, it says here, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, you mean there's something more? Yeah, keep reading. But also to suffer for his sake. Why would you suffer if salvation is just simply belief? What about these big, these uh, church buildings that I just read about there? The Presbyterian, the Lutheran, the Methodist and the Baptist, are they really suffering? No, they're not. They aren't suffering for Jesus Christ. They're wonderful community get-togethers where everybody gets together and has good social times and lots of fun and good fellowship. They're not suffering. Why? They never reach that stage of repentance leading to belief, leading to a changed life. That's never been there. That's the problem. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. This is where we're going to end it. Pretty soon it'll be so dark you won't even be able to see me. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 10. It says here, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Is it possible to believe a lie? Yeah. Oh yeah, it certainly is. Verse 12, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Verse 14, Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Oh, there's that bad W word. 
work. You see, people can't stand that. These easy believism people, they don't like the, the thought of telling people that there are works necessary, works meet for repentance. Okay? People there in Titus chapter 1, verse 16, it says, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. Yeah, good works will come after salvation. Yes, good works are there to prove that you are truly saved. After you get saved. Don't go out here and lie about me. I'm getting sick and tired of these liars. And they're saying that Brian Denlinger is teaching work salvation. I am not teaching work salvation. You people are liars. And God is going to judge you. Alright? I'm sick of it. I am not teaching work salvation. What I'm teaching is works meet for repentance. This comes after you get saved. Alright? The way you can tell the genuine article as a Christian, did somebody really truly get saved? Did they really come in that repentant state before they believed? The way that you can tell is, after they got saved, did their life change? And if their life changed, then you say, yes, it was legitimate. Yes, it was real. All right? And I'm going to tell you right now, if you get saved, you will struggle with sin. You're not going to be just, bam, sinless, perfect, holy, pure, the first month that you get saved. There are going to be things that you give up very quickly, but there are going to be things that it's going to take you a few years to conquer that sin. I myself struggled with sins. It doesn't matter what all sins I had and stuff. I don't need to go over that. But I myself struggled with sins for years after I got saved. It took a while. But I got victory over those sins. I'm not still struggling with those sins. There needs to be a change. Does the Bible teach easy believism? Yeah, it does. But it's after repentance. It's after you come to the end of yourself. It's after you are broken by falling on the perfect life of Jesus Christ and coming to Him and saying, please purchase me. I will be your bondservant. Put your yoke upon me. Put your burden upon me. Give me that. Then you get saved. That's true salvation. And to teach people that there doesn't have to be any turning from sin, there doesn't have to be any new life, you can just get saved by praying the prayer and you're in. God is forced to take you if you believe in Jesus Christ. Then those sodomites all there, 7,100 church buildings that accept sodomy as being okay, they're all saved. You need to get some truth in you, okay? Because you are believing in a lie. And if you're teaching that lie, you're going to be in trouble with the Lord. So that's going to be it for this study. Let's close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for the challenge from your word. I just am I'm so irritated with this thing of these people preaching this false gospel where they're telling people that there's no need to change, that there's no need to to repent. Uh, it's just so wicked. And what's happening, Lord, is they're creating people that, that believe themselves to be saved and they're not saved. They're not bought by your blood because they've come in pride. They've come in self-righteousness. They're doing what their building is telling them to do. They have no real true relationship with you. And I pray, Lord, if there's any people out there that are preaching this gospel, that they would stop, that they would turn from that and quit preaching that false gospel. And Lord, if there are any people out there that are lying about me in this ministry, it's not about me, Lord. It's about the truth. And they're lying about the truth because your word teaches repentance before belief. Repentance of a man having to give up his pride and his self-righteousness before he can be saved. That's why the Pharisees went to hell. They wouldn't give up their self-righteousness and their pride. They trusted in their own righteousness. And they went to hell. And Lord, these people out there that are lying about the truth, I pray, Lord, that you would stop their mouths and that you would not have people go over there and get messed up and, and fall away and start to preach that false gospel themselves. Because you can get a lot more results when you tell the lost world that they don't need to repent of their sins. You can get a lot more results doing it that way. You can get a lot of people that say, well, then I can be a Christian and not have to change my life, not become a, a bond servant." and not take the yoke upon them. That's what a lot of people think. 
And it's a lie. It's a damnable doctrine of devils. And Lord, I just pray for those out there that they would not be deceived by this false doctrine. And I ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. That's it.